human dignity. And with the, the bullying, I think it's a precursor to the future, what could go on with, the, um, with violence, not just electronically and digitally, but um, physical violence of um, bullying in school and uh, further extensions of maybe um, down the line murder or something like that. And that's something that I'd like to prevent with that compass if we can. Um, I mean, that's already happened so far. Yes. Craigslist killer. Mm -hmm. It's a perfect example. I mean, um, technology was a caveat for that. Um, and uh, it, it's very frightening what these young people can do. Let's and not forget terrorism. Oh, well, I mean, bioterrorism, and then we're, we're uh, starting all over again with the amount of danger that could happen. But with lacking some type of base or moral compass to divert back to, um, as Ms. Montessori said, it, it starts at home, and it should branch out from that. But it's lacking in our society today. And we're not going to get rid of the technology. It's here no. to stay. You know, I try to use it for positive, you know, things. They spread the word. You know, I have a Facebook page. I do a lot of videos of the lectures that I give. I have many followers on Twitter, and I'm hoping that people who read those things, you know, can educate them to be more compassionate and loving towards others in the world. Where does happiness fit in, in terms of your vision for humanity? Because all of the compassion is to lead to happiness. Right. Well, there. You would want everyone to be happy. You want everyone to, to feel happy for themselves. Um, but, you know, Buddhism also believes that there is going to be suffering. Someone is going to always be suffering, but you want it to be minimal. You want people to not, and not everyone to be suffering. So, you know, happiness is, you know, people feeling compassion for one another and living in a society where they're not fearful of their daughter, you know, on the internet, on Facebook, and the cyberbullying that happen, or that their daughter's on YouTube being beaten because the video made it there. You want the happy, you know, I think I lost my train of thought there. Um, minimize the suffering as much as you can. You're not going to get rid of it, but you want to focus on compassion, and that leads to the happiness. Happiness is, is losing yourself and to go to the group. Um, knowing that you did your absolute best to um, better yourself and, and better the people around you. Um, you know, I, I hear what the, what the Dalai Lama is saying, and I think back to uh, what my dad told me, that love is the greatest word in, um, in the human language. And that's what we need to spread with technology, um, is the idea that well, I, you know, I can see it where people are getting lost and think they're, they're their own just individuals and they're not necessarily a, a part of something greater when they do use technology. Um, but they, I think we can use technology in a sense where we're creating um, you know, a community and, and building a, you know, a team aspect that we're all in this together um, rather than to use it negatively like we've talked about before. But what is happiness? I mean, I, I don't want to put... Peace of mind. Is it a peace of mind? It's being financially stable. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Asimo, what is... Um, what's Knowledge. Knowledge. And learning. <laughs> <laughs> Knowledge and learning. Mm -hmm. and my, my favorite memories are of me reading. Um, and I, there's no way we can understand everything that's in our universe. Um, but to just not try, to, you know, to know what little we can know about it. That, that sounds very uh, individualistic. How's that, that? In the sense that, I mean, you seem to be, I mean, your greatest memory was what you read and the knowledge that you gained. Um, I think that. Isn't anybody's greatest memory about themselves? No, I think the, the greatest, my greatest memory Enjoy is. is <laughs> <laughs> my, you know, my greatest memory is isn't the success I had. It's not the 10 national championships, the 88 games in a row. I mean, I can spout off, you know, every sort of statistic my... As you are. Uh, I'm just going <laughs> to ask a point, okay? Um, I, I can spout all that off if I wanted to, but my greatest success is that, you know, I created individuals that could function in society. I, I created men who, you know, who understand the greater picture and not just 
what they did. Coach Wooden, I apologize, I didn't mention earlier. I was a university uh, professor at Boston University for 10 years. Um, and I was writing the, all, the, all the while while doing that. And people lined up for my class. Why? Not because I was doing anything different. I was mostly teaching exactly how I learned, but because I knew the content so well and I had such a passion for it. And, and that transferred to it. So, so, so I, with all the books that you've written, have you taught something to someone? Abs what's I was your, what's 10 your years. your lasting impression? As a professor. I, I have many people tell me how much I um, influenced them to write um, books and how I encourage them to go into um, science fiction and how the science that, I mean, I will go back and rewrite more productive members of society. According to them, absolutely. How? How so? Right, what? How so if what you're saying is the only amount of knowledge that you've gained is your greatest accomplishment? <laughs> uh, I think this is important because I would also question the Dalai Lama as to what uh, he would feel is the most important part of his life. What knowledge because, uh, I mean, it could be somewhat solipsistic, but it's also a question of inner peace. Mm -hmm. Can you do that in a, a, a team or in a crowd? Yes. How? Um, I think trying to, I, I have a very thorough background in, you know, in my education, um, many different um, subjects that I was taught, and I feel that having that background helps me to understand my inner, in my inner side most. And what my goal is, is to, you know, minimize suffering in the world and create happiness. And I feel like if I can do that and touch the lives of some people, then that helps them to you know that fulfillment and educate them. Do Dolly, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly because I've been working for years ever since I was in my fourth year at Hogwarts um, for creatures, not even human beings, but creatures who were t treated like slaves in our castle. And they, were, and they were subjugated to all kinds of inhumane efforts. And I tried to make sure that they were free. And that, that prompted me to work with the ministry to try to work with other people who were, tr who were subjugated to, to horrible injustices that I really feel that you have to work and you have to make sure that you're serving other people. And I agree that you have done some good, very good work on, on, the, on these topics and that it's something that is very dear to my heart as well and that we need to not only focus on the technology but the humanity behind that technology as well. Educate also about empathy, you know, being empathetic towards others and I think that goes a long way as well. Okay. Does technology sometimes get in the way of that? I think so. What do we do about that? That's where it comes down to the education system and being able to make those changes, trying to make those changes, or you know, incorporating moral development and having that foundation for our students. Because it's not just going to start with the students who are in high school or college now. It starts at you know when they're younger, when they're little, and we're beginning. And we start with those generations. I also think we have to be careful with labeling things as good or bad and labeling technology itself as good or bad. I think we, when we are evaluating systems and evaluating technology, we need to think of it in terms of effective or ineffective in, in what our goal is at that time, in that situation, in that context, going back to that again. So I think instead of us labeling things as good as bad, robots are good or bad, you know, having robots in school, good or bad, I think we need to focus on effective ineffective. Well, even if the, if the rest of the world is doing it, I think we're doing it a disservice by not, allowing, by not having our kids do it. So, wait, what do you mean? So, if, if there are, if, if, if China has uh, robot teachers and it's working for them, and we, should, we should adopt that and keep up with them and do, and do what they're doing. Not, not necessarily compete with them, but see what they're, see what they're doing and how we can out innovate. Couldn't we, oh, sorry. <laughs> Couldn't we more, though, just incorporate them? It doesn't have to be completely a change, kind of a co-teaching well, model? We need, to, we need to stay ahead of the game, or at least be, be in the top running with them. But, 
No, you can go this time. Um, how do you know that in the future, though, what they're doing now is going to be effective and not yeah, ineffective? Yeah. And how do you know that we're not going to lose our humanity, though? Because that's where I fear that's what's going to happen, that we'll be able to be able to take that agree. feeling part of our brain saying. out. I agree with what you're saying, but it's, it's the truth of the matter. That we're, by not moving more into technology in the classroom, by not giving each student a laptop and letting them hand in assignments through the internet and taking their books home and reading their e-books, um, yeah, it's, things things are changing, but we're doing well, we would be doing a disservice by not offering that to our, to our youth. Well, how do you fit in the moral development of it all then? Um, same as what we're doing now. Do you have good role models? Do we have good role models? I don't. I couldn't see how we could have better role models. Well, I think we have good and bad role models, but just like um, John was saying with the technology, it's neutral. The role models are neutral, and using our moral compass, we need to set our children, our future students up for success by saying, listen, this is, this is an efficient or productive member of society. This is the harm that this person is doing, just like the technology. This technology can be used for this, and this is a wrong use. And then um, hopefully they will use it effectively. Are you saying it's up to the, the individual to, to make that choice then? It's up to I, the teacher. Well, I mean, I'm, yeah, it, I think it's the individual ultimately. I mean, because everyone who's in a class, every student that's in the class, the teacher can't control their fate and their destiny. So, I mean, hopefully they have an accurate moral compass with the forethought of human dignity to, um, in the future, to conduct themselves accordingly and not be that person um, murdering or Craig, Craig, uh, Craigslisting. Craigslisting, et cetera, <laughs> or letting the robots take over. No offense, Asimo. And I was just going to say, I definitely think that technology can be used to create a dystopia. I mean, I've written countless short stories about where, um, you know, there's a teacher that's a robot and um, the students aren't learning and they, you know, discover a book in the attic and they're shocked to see that this is how people used to learn. They, and um, it's a strange concept for them to believe that education was once done by teachers. So I've written plenty of stories where it is not a good outcome using technology, but not because they were using technology, but because they weren't making their own choices about what they were learning. Because self-education, I believe, exactly. is what's important. I, I agree. But you do have to have uh, good moral compasses and, and teachers. And that's why I actually think that uh, teachers and professors should be Valued higher than um, valued at the same level as such as such as doctors, um, because as long as we don't respect their contribution to this to the society, that it's really doing our society a disservice. Um, although I did have very good and very bad professors uh, during my tenure at Hogwarts, I definitely feel the value of a good professor outweighs any. Um, any price that you could put on that on that on that education. I believe um, in my schools that the teacher in the room is more of a facilitator. They're not a babysitter. They're not a punisher. But their job is more to help grow, help the student grow, to provide a safe environment, and then foster relationships. Kind of teach at that young age, you know, talking about morals and values. Kind of teaching other children how to interact with one another. And I don't know. I can't really see a robot or a computer doing that. You know, modeling that inter like the interaction between two students, giving the feedback, and kind of really, you know, modeling those social skills that they need at such a young age. I can see. I can see a robot doing that. I, I mean. I have a problem with it because it doesn't seem as sincere. I mean, um, in a lecture I had one time I mentioned, you know, um, <coughs> every, I'm sure you've heard of uh, a person playing a robot against, in a chess match. Well, that human is feeling and it, it's seeing and it really doesn't know what move they're going to do. It's calculating it, whereas a robot is cold and it's just move here, move here, move there. Well, eventually, the robots, as we evolve, hypothetically speaking, the robots will start playing themselves. But who really wants to watch a match of robots playing themselves? I mean, I, 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 open, <laughs> awesome up. I, I, I would really like to give you the floor after, after this. But no, I was just saying I would like to watch. I, I'm sure you would. But <laughs> relating to Miss Montessori, um, I think that emotion, that uh, 
the emotion that sincerity is, is lost, that intimacy, excuse me, if you will, is lost when a robot is, has the option to view and give feedback like that. It, it's not there. It's kind of like that you, human that human element is very important. And I think as we progress in the future, it's, it's going to be missed and underrated. And it's, it's similar to talking to your TV. You know, I mean, yeah, you may shout back and forth at certain shows or talk shows. But I mean, um, if that's your only companion or the, the TV is giving you feedback on your, your interaction with other people, it, it's not what I think is in our best interest for humankind. The go along cast there. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, you can call me Leon. It's uh, fine. Leon. Um, I, I think as technology moves forward, um, we really need to be wary about losing that, that human aspect. Um, you know, I, I try to preach in my coaching that um, it, it's our faults, it's our shortcomings that make us human. And you learn the most by overcoming these faults and shortcomings. You learn a lot about who you are as a person. You learn a lot about um, you know, what it, the value of, of hard work and really what it takes. I, I think those are, are really what makes us human. Um, and I get worried about taking the, the human element out of that because I, I really think of need to recognize our faults and, and see where, where we're able to improve on them. I want to stop now because our uh, commercial uh, sponsors have a word to say, but we're at the end of our time. I will allow for uh, one comment from each of you. And then I want to thank you all for the presentation and your discussion tonight. Let's thank uh, Hermione. We're going to refer to the Dalai Lama as Dalai, and you have to proceed it as Dalai. Dalai Lama, I'm sorry. I think we have to know that technology is here to stay, but it needs to be guided a little more thoroughly with the idea of compassion and empathy in there. Um, we don't just want to let it take its own course because then I feel like we'll lose humanity in the end. Okay. Um, I also agree that you know, technology is here to stay. It's not going to go away, but it needs to be introduced at a young age and um, the connection needs to be made with in the classroom in real life. And it also needs to be a supplement to what they're doing, not just completely take the place of everything. Okay, John. Um, I think that we need to keep in mind continual growth and think about what our goals are, whether it be humanity, whether it be getting kids' interest and in making them not bored in school, whatever it may be. I think we have to take those things and think about how we can use technology to be more effective. Mr. Hossamuth. I do not fear computers. I fear the lack of them. Uh, I just think we need to move away from standardization and move towards customization, creating innovators and not number pressures. Yeah. Humans first. Uh, no matter what technology evolves, what robots we see, no matter what happens, humans first um, going into the future. And we need, it's imperative that we have a moral compass. There are many moral basis to a lot of uh, these arguments that we've heard tonight. And I feel that um, technology equals magic in my world, and that magic is not always might, um, and that we need to control um, the, t the types of technology. But at the same time, we need to make sure that 